Hey, what is up guys, Mergaman4 here, and I'm back with another classic series review. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at Season 22, Colin Baker's first full season as the Doctor, and the apex of the original series issues with darkness and violence. So the question is, does this season deserve the criticisms that have been put towards it? Why don't we dive in and find out? <laughs> Season 22 had a difficult task ahead of it, primarily making people fall in love with the Sixth Doctor after the unfavorable impression left by the Twin Dilemma at the end of the prior season. But the Doctor's new persona wasn't the only change that audiences had to adjust to. While this wasn't the first time the Doctor Who had been shown in 45 minute installments, this was the first time it was designed that way, and the season's episode count was cut in half to compensate. Additionally, the violence and more mature themes were increased significantly. Put together, these elements combine to create a season which remains one of Doctor Who's most controversial seasons, and indeed, one that almost marked the end of the original program. But, as it turns out, it wasn't the end. Not quite yet. So, nearly 40 years on, why don't we take a look at the six stories that comprise the controversial season 22. <laughs> I find my thoughts on Attack of the Cybermen a bit hard to place. On the one hand, it is a pretty entertaining story for the most part. It's got some interesting ideas and a great guest cast, including the welcome returns of Morris Colburn as Lytton and David Banks as the Cyber Leader. But on the other hand, it's also a bit of a mess. For one thing, this story is filled to the brim with continuity porn. From the Doctor fixing the chameleon circuit, to revisiting Totter's Lane, to throwaway references to numerous past companions and callbacks to many past Cyberman stories, including the return of Telos Tombs and a plot to reverse the destruction of Mondas, hearkening back to the very first Cyberman appearance, the Tenth Planet. I mean, don't get me wrong, normally I'm all for a continuity nod or two. I love that sort of thing, but here, there's just so many of them that it just feels forced and unnatural, and it makes it seem like this story is more interested in reminding you of the show's past glories than it is of telling a good story in its own right. The other major issue here is the plot itself. It's not that it's particularly hard to follow, just that it doesn't feel like it comes together as a coherent whole. Rather than feeling like one continuous storyline, Attack of the Cybermen instead feels like a bunch of individually written scenes that have been stitched together after the fact. We jump from plot point to plot point rather than choosing one or two storylines to really focus in on, and some elements are introduced only to be swiftly forgotten about and never to be brought up again, such as the Doctor being used as a Time Lord agent against his will. Again, I do want to say that I'm entertained by this story. The returns of Lytton and David Banks' Cyber Leader are welcome additions. It's great to see Terry Malloy playing a role other than Davros. It's surprisingly the first time we get a real sense of the cyber conversion process on screen, even if it is fairly fleeting. And I'm actually a big fan of the bleak and hopeless storyline of Bates and Stratton, uh, which in my books is the most interesting plot thread of the whole story. So Attack of the Cybermen certainly isn't devoid of the good bits. It's just that, unfortunately, there aren't quite enough of them for me to justify a score higher than a 6.5 out of 10. Now that's more like it. Colin Baker's era of Doctor Who was often criticized for its excessive violence, this story being a prime example. But that's exactly the point that Vengeance on Veros is trying to make that violence for the sake of entertainment is a dangerous thing. And because of that, I think this story gets away with it. You're supposed to find it deplorable. But violence wasn't the only thing on writer Philip Martin's mind, as this story also examines class systems and the corruption of democracy. And people say that Doctor Who shouldn't be political? This story is only as strong as it is because of its scathing political critiques. But that's not to say that the story is devoid of other good elements. Far from it. It's another great guest cast in this story, this time led by Martin Jarvis as the governor of Veros. And of course, we also have Nabil Shaban's unforgettable performance as Syl, arguably the most iconic alien menace of the 80s. 
certainly of Colin Baker's tenure. Extremely atmospheric, effortlessly relevant, and incredibly entertaining, Vengeance on Veros is one of the Sixth Doctor's best, and easily scores an 8 out of 10 from me. You know, giving the Doctor a new Time Lord adversary to face other than the Master is a really great idea that the show ought to make more use of. Indeed, the Rani is easily the best part about Mark of the Rani. Kate O'Mara gives a superb performance, and the character's motivations are suitably distinguished from most other Doctor Who villains. She doesn't want power or to destroy, she just wants to further her scientific studies. It's a shame then that it was decided that she would debut with the Master at her side. Don't get me wrong, I love the Master. It's just that his inclusion here doesn't really serve any purpose. He's basically just window dressing, and it isn't even one of Anthony Ainley's most memorable performances. His inclusion here ultimately just distracts from the main attraction. Unfortunately, I also don't find the setting particularly inspiring, at least in execution. I'm sure the Industrial Revolution could be used to great effect in a Doctor Who story, but I feel like this one just doesn't really do much with it, nor with historical figure George Stevenson, who, speaking of which, I believe is the first real-life historical figure the show's featured since the pure historicals of the 1960s which makes it even more of a shame that this story misses out on the thing I love the most about those historicals. Learning about history. I walk away from the Mark of the Rani feeling like I've learned very little about either the period or the people who shaped it, which I think is a great shame. Ultimately, it's an okay story, if a rather underwhelming one. But hey, at least it gave us Kato Mara's Rani. It's gonna be a 6 out of 10 from me. I have conflicting feelings about the two Doctors. It's a strange one. There's a lot of elements that really should work here, but as it turns out, a lot of them just fall flat. For one thing, it's a multi-Doctor story, and not just any multi-Doctor story, but featuring the return of one of my all-time favorite TARDIS teams. We have the Sontarans coming back, written by their original creator, and said creator is Robert Holmes, one of the most iconic Doctor Who writers of all time. So what exactly went wrong? Well, I don't think it's contentious of me to say that The Two Doctors is the weakest multi-Doctor story, due in large part to the fact that Patrick Troughton spends a significant amount of the runtime either taken out of the action or as an androgum, though at least Jamie gets to spend a substantial amount of time with the Sixth Doctor. As for the Sontarans, at least they're an improvement over their last outing? But that's not really saying much, and the story really fails to capitalize on the charm and menace that they had when they were first introduced in The Time Warrior. And as for Robert Holmes himself, this is definitely one of his weaker and least memorable scripts for the show, which is especially notable coming off the back of The Caves of Androzani, which was arguably his best contribution. But that's not to say that the story is devoid of any positives. In a frequent theme for the season, I'm rather fond of the guest cast, and even though I feel like the story didn't take full advantage of the second Doctor and Jamie, it is always a lot of fun to see them on screen again. And I do really enjoy the idea of the Androgums. In fact, I think the story would have been significantly improved had the Sontarans been removed entirely and we just focused in on them and Dastari. And despite being the longest story of the season, and indeed the entire decade, bar Trial of a Time Lord, it still moves along at a fairly brisk pace. It's definitely one of those stories that doesn't feel its length, or at least justifies it. So The Two Doctors isn't a bad story by any means. It's got some good, entertaining stuff at its core, it's just held back by some significant flaws. That being said, I do still find it one of the more entertaining stories of season 22, so I'm going to be giving it a 7 out of 10. So, I have a bit of a confession to make. I actually kind of like Time Lash, and I don't mean it in an ironic way, I mean I genuinely don't think this is a bad story. To be perfectly honest, I've never understood what the fuss is all about. To me, Time Lash has never been anything more than mediocre at worst. And I have to admit, watching it through this time around, I think I enjoyed it more than I ever have. Now before I continue, I do feel I need to clarify that I don't think Time Lash is some hidden gem that deserves to be re-evaluated by the masses. Far from it. It definitely still has its issues and ultimately still falls into my bottom third of Doctor Who stories. 
But I think its reputation amongst fandom is so extreme, a lot of people even considering it a strong contender for worst story of all time, that even saying something like, it's fine, feels like high praise. And that's the truth of it here. I think Time Lash is fine. Nothing more, nothing less. But ultimately, I'm entertained by it on the whole. I like the plot, I like the characters, mostly. Uh, I think the Borad is one of the best executed monster designs of the whole of Classic Who. And I am also frequently surprised when people describe Paul Darrow's performance as this ridiculously over-the-top thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's hardly subtle, but we have had way crazier guest performances in Classic Who that make Paul Darrow as Tekker seem positively tame. To be honest, there's really only two things I properly dislike about Time Lash. Herbert, whose inclusion here, while a nice idea, ultimately falls flat and feels pointless to me, not helped by the fact that the actor heavily reminds me of Matthew Waterhouse's Adric, a character I'm not too fond of, and the resolution is an utter mess. The fake-out Borad death just feels cheap, as does the Doctor's I'll explain later resolution to the whole Bandrel subplot. But for about three quarters of the story, I have a pretty decent time. It's not anything special, and it's never going to be a favorite of mine, but I am continually baffled by its reputation. Time Lash is absolutely fine. And because of that, I'm going to be giving it a 6.5 out of 10. And thus, we've arrived at the conclusion of Colin Baker's first full season in the role of the Doctor. And thankfully, it goes out on a high. Despite my controversial opinions on the last story, I don't think it's at all unpopular for me to suggest that Revelation of the Daleks is not only the best story of Season 22, but the entirety of the Sixth Doctor's run. The relationship between the Doctor and Perry, while it still has its rough patches, is finally starting to solidify. We've got a truly fantastic guest cast all round, and the story is magnificently directed by one of Doctor Who's all-time greats, Graham Harper. Revelation of the Daleks strikes the perfect balance for the black comedy it's going for, with a lot of humor reminiscent of the great Robert Holmes, even outdoing Holmes' own story for season 22, alongside a lot of grim and gruesome but extremely well-executed moments. Admittedly, the cliffhanger is pretty lame, although it does tease a fascinating timeline-crossing plot thread not unlike those from the Stephen Moffat era, only to do absolutely nothing at all with it. And the DJ does feel surplus to requirements. I do like the concept of it, but I feel like his plot thread could have been refined a little bit more. And ironically, despite being a Dalek story, they're probably the least interesting element in it. I think it almost might have been better had the Grey Daleks been the only Daleks in the story, since the reveal that they've been summoned to take care of Davros is probably the only genuinely great Dalek moment in Revelation of the Daleks. But ultimately, the story does so much right that these are pretty minor complaints. All in all, a fantastic story to end Season 22 on. At the very least, I'm glad that Colin Baker has at least one TV story that I feel confident in giving a 9 out of 10 to. Well, one thing's for sure, there's a lot to say about Season 22. Well, ultimately, there's only a couple of stories that I'm properly a fan of, I think it's safe to say that I'm a lot more forgiving on this season's flaws than most other people are. For one thing, while there's only two stories I'd give above a 7 out of 10, there also aren't any I'd put below a 6. For another, I think Colin Baker's Doctor gets a bad rap. Admittedly, I haven't really talked about him all that much in my reviews of these stories, and that's mainly because I don't feel like he truly comes into his own until season 23, but honestly? The odd moment aside, he's a perfectly fine doctor, and Colin Baker himself is excellent in the role. I do agree that he's a bit too harsh on Perry at times, which is where season 23 really saves the day, and while I generally don't have an issue with the violence, I feel like most of the time it works in the story and is justified. It does feel very jarring to see the Doctor wielding a weapon himself to threaten or coerce people in almost every story. Now, I've no issue with him shooting Cybermen. Even the fifth Doctor, one of the most passive Doctors, has done that. But him telling Perry to threaten Russell with the gun to get information out of him is just wrong, and flat out killing Shockeye with the cyanide and the two Doctors is completely unjustified and is one of, if not the, most out of character Doctor moments in the entire show. But for the most part, these are singular moments, and aside from the two I've just mentioned, I can forgive the other instances. On the whole, Season 22 definitely has its issues, but I find that they're often blown out of proportion. I'm not sure if I'll ever love Season 22, 
but I certainly don't find myself hating it. And with that, let's compare Season 22 to the other seasons that have been released in the collection range so far. Firstly, I'd rank the six stories of Season 22 as follows. Revelation of the Daleks at the top with a 9 out of 10, followed by Vengeance on Veros with an 8 out of 10, The Two Doctors with a 7 out of 10, Attack of the Cybermen and Time Lash both with 6.5 out of 10, and finally The Mark of the Rani with a 6 out of 10. Altogether, Season 22 received an average of 7.17 out of 10, which places it near the bottom of my ranking, in 8th place out of 11. However, this does manage to increase the average score of the 1980s to 6.94 out of 10, while Colin Baker's era once again drops behind John Pertwee with a new average of 7.35 out of 10. Though surprisingly, this still puts him in second place so far. In terms of Season 22's writers, Robert Holmes maintains the highest average of the season, though The Two Doctors drops his score slightly to an 8.19 out of 10, though he remains in 8th place. Just behind him is Eric Sayward, whose placement has dropped 4 spots since last time, with a new average of 8.13. Philip Martin, however, maintains his previous average of 8 out of 10, while Glenn McCoy's only script positions him in 24th place with a 6.5 out of 10. Finally, Pip and Jane's contributions to Season 22 drops their score slightly to a 6.13 out of 10, with a position of 27th place. As with the decade average, John Nathan Turner's next contribution as producer has increased his score slightly to a 6.94 out of 10, a decent way above Graham Williams, but still well behind Barry Letts and Philip Hinchcliffe. Eric Sayward's average as script editor also sees an increase, for the first time passing over a 7 out of 10, though his position remains the same. As for season 22's directors, Graham Harper enters the list strong in first place, and is currently only one of two directors to have an average score of at least 9 out of 10. It's then some way down until our next directors, Peter Moffat and Pennant Roberts, who are back to back with average scores of 7.5 out of 10. It's another drop down to 21st place where we have Matthew Robinson with an average score of 6.5 out of 10, followed by Sarah Hellings in 24th with a 6 out of 10, and finally Ron Jones in 25th, who despite directing two of my favorite six Doctor stories is stuck with an average of 5.88 out of 10 due to a certain story called Time Flight. Oh well. In terms of premieres, Attack of the Cybermen ends up right around the middle, ranking between Robot and The Mask of Mandragora. Revelation of the Daleks, meanwhile, enters the finale ranking amongst the top three, and as a result of these stories, the premiere average drops and the finale average increases just enough so that both average scores are exactly the same. Speaking of balance, Season 22 manages to put one story in both the top and bottom tens. Revelation of the Daleks comes in 8th from the top, and The Mark of the Rani comes 10th from the bottom. In terms of the other stories from Season 22, Vengeance on Veros places 16th, The Two Doctors 37th, Attack of the Cybermen 40th, and Time Lash 42nd out of a total of 59 stories. And that concludes my thoughts on Season 22. Does it have problems? Yeah, it does. But you know what, I think there's a lot more to enjoy here than general consensus would suggest. It may not be the greatest season ever, but it's still a fairly enjoyable time. But what do you think? Please leave your thoughts down in the comments below. And with that, Morgan Man 4, over and out, and I'll see you guys later.